Okay. Well, we are back in Matthew chapter 4 today. We'll pick off where we left off uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so as you're turning there, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we approach your word, Lord, we do, we do come to you and we ask that you would help us, guide us in your word, uh, in truth, in wisdom, in discernment. If there is anything, Lord, that I might say that is a misrepresentation of your word uh, or of the point that you are trying to get across, I pray, Lord, that you would supernaturally keep me from, from doing that. I pray, Lord, that I would rightly handle this word of truth. I pray that you would use your word uh, to shape us and to mold us. May we stand in awe of you. May we learn from your example. Uh, and God, may we apply these truths to our lives. So we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Again, uh, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. This is a continuation from, again, two weeks ago. We jumped into Matthew chapter 4, going into the temptation of the king. And so in the, the chapters that uh, have come before this, Matthew is painting this picture and he's making the case that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that the, the people have been waiting for. He showed in, uh, in chapter 1 uh, through Jesus' uh, royal line to David and then through his virgin birth, he fulfills all these prophecies concerning him. Then we look at chapter 2 and it's all about the, the response of the people to the birth of the king. And then chapter 3, we have this coronation of the king, where in a way, through Jesus' um, being baptized by John the Baptist, uh, we see kind of this coronation that, that God himself is saying, this indeed is the Messiah. When he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down upon him, and then the Father spoke, saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And so right after that, the text tells us in chapter 4, Jesus is led out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and here he is tempted by Satan. Satan is the adversary to God. They call him this title, uh, Diablos, the devil, which is the deceiver. Um, he, he is the one who is the accuser. And so he comes and he starts to attempt to deceive the Messiah. And uh, two weeks ago, we looked at this first deception, this first temptation of Satan to Jesus. And the first temptation was that Jesus would doubt the word of God. It's the same temptation that we find in the very beginning of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, that he causes and sows seeds of doubt, that we would begin to doubt what God says. Because at the end of chapter 3, right before we get into chapter 4, God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So is that, is that enough that when God speaks, we believe? Or do we need the, the extra miracles on top of that? And so Satan says, you know, if you are, yeah, I know the father just said you are the son of God, but if you really are, then you'll take these rocks and you'll turn them into bread, right? You've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I know you're hungry. Provide for yourself. Do this miraculous thing. And so Jesus then appeals to the authority in Scripture. Even though Jesus is the Word put on flesh, He doesn't just say something. He says, it is written, appealing to the authority of Scripture. And He goes to Deuteronomy and He says, it is written that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, And this is a great example for you and I. When we face temptation to doubt the Word of God, man, we go to the authority that is the Word of God. And this is what Jesus does. So now Satan, he starts to, uh, he starts to go into his next temptation. So the first temptation is get us to doubt the Word of God. When that doesn't work, well, Satan then uses the Word of God. He uses the Word of God, but he distorts it, and he perverts it, and he misapplies it in hopes of leading you astray. This is what he does for Christ. So as we come into the text in Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 5, we see the enemy using the word of God and perverting it, distorting it, misapplying it to try and deceive the Messiah. Uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil, the deceiver, he took 
him, Jesus, to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Pause for a moment. Don't you think of this pinnacle of the temple? The temple uh, is, is supposed to be uh, high and lofty. It's supposed to be this meeting place, this intermediary between earth and the heavens. And so here he's taking him to the pinnacle of the temple. It's not 100% certain exactly where this portion of the temple would have been, but it's likely part of Herod's reconstruction. Many believe it's the eastern side that overlooks the Kidron Valley. And the reason being, Josephus writes about this portion of the temple that overlooks the Kidron Valley, and it's a very high point, and it overlooks the valley, and it's about 450 feet above the valley that's below. So for a way of comparison, the, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is 220 feet, which you drive above the water below. And that's pretty high. I mean, unfortunately, I, I lived in San Francisco for a while. That, now, maybe that was, un, that was fortunate. That was fine. That was fine. But unfortunately, lots of people would come from all over the world to commit suicide on that bridge. And they would come to jump off of it. And that bridge is 220 feet. And here, likely, Jesus stands at the pinnacle of the temple that's twice that height, looking over this valley. And so Satan then tempts him, and he says this. And verse 6, he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Man, what a temptation. Throw yourself down, Jesus. Just jump off from here. For it is written, He, the Father, will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And this is exactly what Satan was desiring to do, to put God's word to the test. And here he does it by again, misapplying scripture, taking it completely out of context. He quotes from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Now, this, this psalm in, in Psalm chapter 91 is all about Yahweh being our refuge. He's our refuge. He's the one who watches over and protects us in times of trouble. It has nothing to do with Jesus being at the pinnacle of a temple and jumping off so that the angels will protect him and keep his foot from, from hitting a stone. So he takes it and he totally misapplies it. He perverts the word of God in order to get a response from Jesus. But Jesus does not take the bait, just like you and I shouldn't. So if we understand from the word of God that God is sovereign over all things, he's in control of everything. He's in control of your life completely. We know from the, the scriptures that they say that your days have even been numbered before you were born. Right? So the, this is all God's word. We know this to be true. So what does that mean, though? Does that mean, then, that you can drive on the freeway going 90 miles per hour and, no, I don't need to wear my seatbelt. God knows my days. God's completely in control. You know, I don't even have to, Jesus, you take the wheel. I don't even have to steer this bad boy. No, that's, that's being absurd, and that's testing the mercy and the grace of God. And this is exactly what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to get Jesus to go outside of the will of the Father and test the Father. Is it enough that, that Jesus knows who he is? He knows what God has already said, that this is my son. But Satan's saying, man, if you really are, then you should be able to jump off and God will be obligated to rescue you because that's what his word says. It's a, it's a misapplication of the word and this is what we see Time and time again, from Satan, we see it from modern day prophets and teachers. So the question is, do we actually trust the word of God? Or do we need the miraculous to accompany it? That's a real question that we need to ponder. Because there's a lot of people who, they demand the miraculous. It's not enough for them that God has spoken. It's not enough for them that God has preserved his word through generation upon generation. 
That's not enough. God, give me a little sign. Give me a little miracle if what you say is true. But I want you to understand that miracles never convert anyone. Miracles do not convert. Jesus went through and he did a lot of mighty works confirming and validating that he indeed was the Messiah. He did these things to fulfill prophecies about the Messiah. None of those miracles converted anyone. None of them. You know, when people wanted to follow Jesus because he fed them when he would preach and he fed thousands of people with very little food, very little resources. How about when he raised Lazarus from the dead and then shortly after people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're laying the palm branches and they're welcoming into the city. He's the king. But those very same people who loved the miracles of Jesus ultimately cried out for Jesus to be crucified. Why? Because the miraculous does not satisfy. People will always desire more. That was a good miracle, but what about tomorrow? I need a miracle tomorrow. And that was a good one, but now it's always looking for the next biggest, brightest, best thing. And so in this context too, there were a lot of people who if they came and made a proclamation of being Messiah, they would try to accompany it with supernatural things. There's a story of one person um, who actually jumped from this pinnacle claiming to be Messiah, and clearly he died. So th this has nothing to do with a lack of evidence or a lack of miracles. It has everything to do with the condition of our heart. Or Jesus tells us, when he talks about the rich man and Lazarus, he, he says and makes it very clear that even if someone were to come and rise from the grave, that people would still not believe. If you do not believe the scriptures, you will not believe the prophets, you will not believe Moses, you're not going to believe just because some supernatural thing happened. You're going to constantly be looking for more. So do we trust God and his word, or are we looking for the miraculous. There's lots of people who desire the miraculous over the truth of God's word. And boy, Satan can use that to deceive us very quickly. But there were religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they demanded a sign from Jesus. They demanded a sign. And this was Jesus's response to them. This is his response to us. Matthew 16, 4, Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah, right? That Jesus, as Jonah went into the belly of the fish for three days and then he came out, Jesus will be buried in the earth and on the third day he will rise again. But even that was not enough to convince people because it's not about the evidence, it's about the heart. So Jesus knows that Satan is perverting and misapplying the passages here. And so what is his defense? Well, his defense is to rightly handle the word of truth. His defense, again, is to appeal to the authority of Scripture, but to use it in its correct context. And he, again, quotes from Deuteronomy. This is in Deuteronomy 16. And remember, every time the, these three, yes, what did I say? Deuteronomy 6, 16. So every time that Jesus appeals to Scripture, he appeals to the passages in Deuteronomy. Again, making a connection between the nation of Israel and their 40 years in the wilderness and Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. The nation of Israel, they succumb to temptation. Jesus does not succumb to the temptation. He completes what they never could. Jesus is the one that the writer of Hebrews says, he's the one who has faced every temptation that you and I have faced yet he is without sin. So he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Now understand the context here too. The context is Moses is kind of recapping in Deuteronomy for the nation of Israel all the things that they have been through. And he reminds them, when you go into the land that God has promised your forefathers, you are to obey the commandments of Yahweh. And you obey him, and so you need to fear the Lord. And not only do you fear the Lord, but then you teach your children to fear the Lord. And then you teach your grandchildren to fear the Lord, that there will be generation upon generation of those who fear him. And then it goes into the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God 
with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. And these words that I command you today, you shall teach to the next generations. Right? You're going to talk about them when you rise up, when you lie down, when you're in your house, when you walk by the way. And the reason you're going to do that is because when you go into the promised land, filled with all these things that you have not worked for, you haven't done the work. And so God is just going to give you these things, but in your comfort, there's going to be a temptation to fall away from Yahweh, to fall away from Him and to chase after the gods of the culture, the gods of the world. And Yahweh knows this. And so that's the context that He says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. Well, there's more context here. What does he mean as you tested him at Massah? Well, you go to Exodus, and in Exodus chapter 17, we see this is the context that the people of God have been delivered out of Egypt, and they've been brought into the wilderness. I think God has done all these supernatural miracles with the plagues that have hit Egypt, the Passover, right? And then God brings them out. He parts the Red Sea. They come through the Red Sea and then the, the sea closes in on itself, killing the advancing army of the Egyptians. And then when they're hungry, God gives them manna from heaven. Then you get to chapter 17 and the people now are thirsty, and so you would think, okay, people who have seen God work over and over and over again, they're doing the supernatural, uh, they see God doing incredible things, and so of course they trust Him, right? So they, they come to Him and they say, God, we're thirsty, Lord, will you please provide? We know you can do all things. Will you provide for us? If we don't drink, we'll die. No, they don't do that. They grumble, and they complain, and they point their fingers at Moses. Did you bring us out here to the desert to die? And so God tells Moses, you take your staff and you strike the rock and water will come out from this rock and I'm going, to, I'm going to give my people water. But Moses names that place Massah because the people grumbled against Yahweh and they put the Lord to the test. So see, there is so much. When we take a passage of Scripture, there's always so much context to that passage. This is a tapestry of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, and everything in between is one cohesive story about God. We do not take passages in isolation and make them say what we want them to say. God has spoken, and we need to rightly handle this Word of truth. And so this is what Jesus does. He uses this passage, He uses it in the correct context, and He uses it here to say, you do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so he gives us such a beautiful example because when we test God, we question God. When we question God, we are doubting God. We're doubting his abilities. We're doubting his plan. We're doubting his character. And so this is why he calls us to trust him, to trust him, even in the times that it's hard to trust him because of who he is and all that he has done. But we live in a time, and, and Paul, the time was similar, in that there are, very, there are a lot of men and women that call themselves prophets and priests and disciples and pastors that claim to be sent by God, claim to give the truth, but it, that couldn't be further from the truth. They are actually tools in the hands of the enemy that are doing this very same tactic. They take the scriptures and they pervert it and they twist it to fit their own narrative, their own agenda, their own desires. And so many people fall prey to this. There's hundreds of thousands, there's millions of people that follow these heretical teachers. Teachers like Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar and Joe Osteen and so many others. But these people that follow them, they're not victims. They're the ones who have built these preachers, these false teachers up. Because these false teachers tell them exactly what they want to hear. They, they don't know the Word of God because they don't want to know the Word of God. They want to be convinced when these preachers tell them, God wants you to live your best life now. God became poor so that you could be physically rich in this life. 
God wants you, his main goal is for you to prosper and be healthy and wealthy. That's his desire for you. People love that message. And so they don't want to know what God actually says. I just want to take this person's word for it. But again, this is something that has always been. Paul, he writes to the pastor Timothy, who is a pastor over the church in Ephesus, and he tells him what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I want you to think, I think that a, a wise man's words will always be precise. He will choose his words very carefully. When he speaks, how much more when he writes? And so here you have the apostle Paul, who's not just speaking something, he's writing it down for Timothy, for the church in Ephesus, for you and me today. And these are his last words before he is beheaded. This is the last chapter and the last letter that the Apostle Paul penned before he went to die. And he knew his time was coming to an end. And so he's choosing his words very carefully. And he writes to Timothy and he tells him, I charge you in the presence of of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. I charge you in the name of Christ, Timothy, preach the word. That, that's the responsibility of a preacher, of a, of a pastor, of a shepherd, is to preach the word of God, to rightly handle the word of God. His primary responsibility is not to do visitations or not to do um, different discipleship or it's not to do counseling. It's to know and study and immerse themselves and to preach the word of God. That's what the charge is. But Paul says, preach the word of God, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. This is what a preacher who rightly handles the word of God does. Paul has already said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that the word of God is God-breathed and it's useful for correcting, teaching, exhorting. But people don't want that. People don't want correction. They don't want rebuke. They don't want exhortation. They don't want reprove. You know, the psalmist writes a lot about that. It is the fool who hates and despises correction. The fool hates correction. But the man and the woman of God, we understand we haven't arrived yet. And so our whole lives are supposed to be a pursuit of him and a pursuit of him re refining us. He's working out all the rough edges in us. And boy, we have a few. You ever get to the point in your life where you feel like you've made it, man, you're probably a lot worse off than you consider yourself. But we understand we, we, we need God to correct us. We want him to correct us. We welcome that. We receive it because we want him to, to be molding us and shaping us to be more in line with his will. But so many people don't want that. They don't want correction. They just want their ears to be tickled. And that's what he says a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They will not put up with it. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. Do you know how you can prevent yourself from being deceived by someone who desires to pervert the word to fit their own agenda? Do you know how you protect yourself from that? Know the word of God. Know it. You shouldn't take my word for it. Okay, I, that's very nice of you to trust because I said it, but that's very foolish of you. Examine the scriptures. Every one of you should have this word of God. If you don't, we've got some. We want to give it to you. After a message, you should be going home and you should be looking through the passages that I've preached on and said, man, did he, did he distort that? Did he pervert that? Is that in line with what the Word of God, the context, is actually saying? Does it fit the entirety and the tapestry of the Scriptures? 
Look, this is why I pray before I come up here and preach that God, if I were to misapply or misrepresent his word, that he would supernaturally stop me from doing it because I'm under no delusion that I would never misapply God's word. Sure, I would. I'm still in this flesh. And so I pray that if I ever were to do that, either knowingly or ignorantly, that God would stop me from doing it. And so you need to know the word of God. You need to know the word of God to protect yourself. Because we see in this example, the enemy will deceive us. He will attempt to deceive us. He will attempt to tempt us first to doubt God's word. Did God really say that? Did God really say? And maybe you appeal to the authority of scripture. Yes, he did. It is written here. Well, then Satan will turn up the heat. Okay, well, how about I'm going to send some people into your life that pro profess to preach the word of God, but they take it and they distort it, they misuse it, they misapply it to try and get you to follow, yeah, the word of God, but out of context that takes you somewhere far from God. So you need to protect yourself by knowing what it says. And then we see this third temptation, a third temptation of the deceiver to the Messiah that he desires to tempt him with an appeal to the desires of the flesh, the desires of the mind. And he goes to the things that he has to offer. I have these, these things of the world that I can offer you. Look with me at verse 8. Satan makes an appeal here. I think he makes an appeal to man's desire for power and fame, and authority, and wealth, and glory. A desire that many men throughout history have had deeply rooted within them. A desire that we've kind of propped up as a good thing. We desire more glory, more glory, that our name would be famous throughout the generations, rather than properly desiring that God's name would be famous throughout the generations. So he says this in verse 8, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Is there something that is supernatural here that Satan is showing him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory? And you think about all of the military conflicts that have happened building up to this, this setting in human history. You, you think about the, the, the glory of Egypt. You think about the glory of the Babylonian Empire, the, the glory of the Assyrian Empire, the glory of the Persian Empire, the glory of the, the Greek Empire and, and Alexander the Great, the glory of the Roman Empire. You think of the aqueducts and the Colosseums. You, you, you think about the pyramids in Egypt. You think about all these things that, that Satan is saying, look at the glory of the kingdoms of man. Verse 9, and he said to him, all these I will give you. All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So man, Satan goes to the heavy hit and temptation here. But he, he reveals his cards. He reveals his ultimate motivation that men would worship him. This, was, this is how he fell. It was a desire not to worship Yahweh, the one who deserves to be worshipped, but that he wanted worship. And this is a desire that lots of men and women in history, they are tempted with. They don't have a desire to worship God. They want people to worship them. And Satan here wants the Son of God, the Messiah, to worship him. Verse 10, then Jesus says to him, be gone, Satan. Again, appeal to Scripture, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. I love that when Jesus is done entertaining Satan's temptations, He just says, get out of here. Be gone. And Jesus is the one with supreme authority. So what does Satan do? He, he goes... He obeys, he listens, because Jesus is, even though in human flesh, he is still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But here, I think we need to ponder the reality that many men 
and women throughout history have bent the knee to Satan for this same temptation and promise. Because the things of this world are Satan's to give. We have to recognize that. Scriptures say he is the God of this world. When he took Jesus to this high mountain and he's showing him the glory of the kingdoms of man and says, I'll give you all of this, that was his to give to Christ. Temporarily. Temporarily. So the temptation is, are you going to forfeit the eternal for the temporal? Even if the temporal is this really shiny, it looks really good. Man, this would really scratch that itch that I have. Will you succumb to the temptations and again forfeit the eternal for the temporal? This is where Jesus is at. Again, Satan has this temporary authority. I think that's why lots of men in history that have been rulers over nations have been very wicked men that have been willing to kill tens of millions in some cases of innocent people in order to continue to have authority and power and rule and fame and glory because they are bending the knee to the adversary to God, to Satan himself. And so how, how do we be on guard against this kind of temptation? When Satan comes and he tempts us with all the things that the world has to offer, and you think of all the things the world has to offer, how do we guard ourselves? I think it, it starts with you first examining your own heart and asking the question, how much do I love this world and love the things of this world? How attached am I to the things of this world? How strong are my desires for the things of this world? Do you have such a desire for more? More stuff, more stuff, more temporary things that are passing away? If that's where your desires are, man, you are an easy target. Satan, again, who has the authority to give you all the things that this world has to offer, man, he, he may offer them to you. Imagine if he offered you the same thing he's offering Jesus. How many people who profess Christ would take that offer? Man, power and authority over all the nations, glory? Sounds like a good deal. But remember, Jesus tells us in Mark 8, 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Jesus is saying there is nothing in this life that is worth you jeopardizing and sacrificing your eternal rewards for the temporal things that will not last. Jesus knows who he is. He knows that everything is ultimately under his authority. He knows that Mark chapter 28 is coming. Uh, all, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Right? He, he knows, as Paul proclaims, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He knows that's, that's coming. But he's not here for that right now. The scriptures say he did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. That's why he is here. He's here to come and be an atoning sacrifice for our sin, to lay his life down. He's not here to be given the glory over all the nations and have men praise him. Not yet. He has work to do. And so again, he's not going to walk outside of the will of the Father to carry out his own sidebar will. He desires the will of the Father above all else. And this is Satan, again, is trying to tempt him. Just, just do this thing. Just why, why wait for promises that are later on when I could give it to you now? Why, why wait for things that God is saying he's going to give you in eternity when Satan's saying, I can give it to you right now? You know, a, a, a call to follow Christ is a call to delay gratification. Do you understand that? It's a call to delay gratification. It's almost like a curse word in our day. 
to delay gratification? Romans 8, 17, the Apostle Paul says, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. I can't even begin to put into words what that must look like. But he says, if you're children, then you're heirs, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Right? Right now in this life is not the time of glory. In this life is the time to lay your life down, to lay your wants and your desires down for the promises of God that are to come. That's why Jesus says, don't invest in the things of this world. It's all perishing. Don't invest in this world in the kingdoms of men where moth can come in and, and eat at it, where, where rust can come and decay, where thieves can come in and steal it away. There's no security. Invest in the things of the kingdom of God where moth cannot come in and eat away and rust will not decay it and thieves will not come in and steal it away. That Peter says it's kept in heaven. Your inheritance is kept in heaven waiting for you. That should be the investment. That should be our focus. Not on the temporal, but on the eternal. Remember, delayed gratification where we are willing to even suffer in the, the time that we're in for a result that comes later on. Our culture is trying to cultivate within us the opposite of that. Our culture breeds impatience. Our culture breeds selfishness. Our culture breeds an expectation for immediate gratification. Immediate gratification. I want something and I want it right now. Like we live in a time where I don't have to go out to get groceries or order. I just order stuff online. And even Amazon Prime, I got same day delivery on a lot of stuff. I don't have to wait at all. You know, there was a day where if you were you're playing your video games, you'd have to hit pause if you were hungry and you have to actually drive to the store and get some food. But not anymore. You can just get on Grubhub and man, they deliver it right to your door. And there's some positives of this. There's people who really benefit. I mean, there's people who are older in age. There's people who have some physical disabilities that this is a really great thing. But we also have to understand the things that can be really good can also be very detrimental to us, especially for a young generation that this is all they ever know. All they ever know is I have a desire and I need to meet that desire right away. This idea of delayed gratification is so foreign to many people. We understand that delayed gratification is always best. Like, you're not going to go out today and spend all your money because you know, like, that's not wise. Even though I might want to spend all my money on this, I'm not going to do it because I have a future goal. I have something further off that prevents me from just splurging today. I'm not going to eat I love chocolate cake. I'm not going to eat all the chocolate cake for every meal for my life, even though that's maybe what I want to do. I'm not going to do that because further down the road, that would be very detrimental to me. Right? Nobody wants to study or work out, but these are things that you do in the immediate that maybe it hurts, it's painful, but you're doing it for a goal that's further down the road. Like Paul talks about athletes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says they discipline their bodies. They go through rigorous training. They do all of these things to compete for a crown that does not last. How much more should we discipline ourselves and delay gratification for the promises of God for a crown that is imperishable, a crown that will never fade? When we succumb to temptation, we're the ones who miss out. We miss out. God is a good father. He loves us and he cares for us deeply and he knows how to give good gifts to his children and that's what he desires. Just like anybody in here who's, who's a parent or who has cared for somebody, 
It's great joy to be able to bless people. It's a great joy to be able to give good gifts to those who are under your care. How much more our Father desires to give us all good things. But it's not for right now. He has so many promises that are to come. So don't fall for the temptations of the enemy. And when he comes and he tries to persuade you to doubt God's word, appeal to the authority of God's word. And when you do that, and then he distorts and perverts scripture, he sends people into your life that profess to, to be um, ambassadors of God's word, but they distort and pervert it and misapply it. Protect yourself by knowing God's word. Protect yourself by knowing what it says and rightly handling it. And when Satan tempts you with all the shiny things of this world, all the things that are temporarily his to offer you, Remember that everything he can offer you, all the power, all the success, all the fame, all the money, all the pleasures of this life are temporary. They are fleeting. They are passing away. They are here today. They are gone tomorrow. And none of them will satisfy. But the promises of God, the things that he offers, those things are eternal. So as you go through life and you are met with obstacles and challenges and temptations from the enemy, and remember, Jesus is modeling this for us. No one was with him when he was in the wilderness. He came back and he reported this to his disciples. He tells Matthew, write this down so that thousands of years from now, my people can learn from my example. They can do what I have done. And so we learn from it. We keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. I leave you with this. When, when a hurdler is running a race and they have the obstacles and the barriers that are in front of them, they don't succeed by focusing on the obstacle, by focusing on the hurdle. They keep their eyes fixed on the goal. So as we are running this race of life, don't focus on all the temptations that are coming. You fix your eyes on the goal. You fix your eyes on Christ. And he will see you through any and all temptations that come your way.